All right, hello everyone. My name is Fardad. I'm taking care of the um, second half of the semester for you. Uh, one of the bad things about summer semester is that um, uh, you have to cope with two different people teaching your subject. Um, in one hand, it's bad. In the other hand, it's good because uh, that happens in real life. You're halfway through a project and the project manager changes, so you need to be able to cope with your work too. Um, um, I don't know if you've noticed or not, I record my sessions. It goes right on YouTube afterwards, so um, you can refer to it later on if you want to. Uh, it doesn't mean that you shouldn't attend, okay? That's just for a, a, a backup type of thing. Uh, and it's not a guarantee. Sometimes the battery of the microphone goes off, sometimes things don't work, um, and uh, yeah. so. Uh, don't rely on it, let's put it that way. So um, for the second half of the semester, well, while you are with me here, you need to do something uh, uh, that is well, that I call Workshop Zero. Um, workshop Zero is uh, setting up your computer with Git uh, and create a GitHub account for yourself put all your stuff over there. Uh, how many of you saw this thing before coming here? No one? Okay. So you are a member of this team now. I added all of you. So if you go to Microsoft Teams, it's there. Okay? This is the place you're going to collaborate with each other. You're going to ask questions, um, post questions that you have. Um, I'm going to go through the steps one by one, and you'll see exactly how we're going to manage the second half. Uh, my name is Fardat. Um, when I speak English, I say Fardat, but the correct pronunciation is Fardot. But who cares? You can say whatever you want. <laughs> uh, I had Chinese friends that call me Fada. They say it, it means rich. I don't know uh, if that's true or not. But it doesn't? No. <laughs> not true. So, lie to me. I'm going to go to Guli and say, You lied to me. <laughs> All right. So. <laughs> All right, so yeah, uh, I don't know. He just wanted to probably fool around and make fun of me, but that's it. So um, uh, we are in Canada, which means no one knows anybody's name. Like um, your different cultures, it's very difficult to remember names. So I, beforehand, I, I sincerely apologize for misspelling your name, mispronouncing your name, and um, I apologize for that. Um, and you are free to mispronounce my name if you want to. In return, I'm, I'm fine with that. Uh, uh, communication. Like the most important thing you need to know is how to communicate with your prof. To communicate with your prof, please so communicate with me. Please do not use email. Email is for logging purposes only. If you send an email to me, it's going to get buried in thousands of emails that I receive. And hopefully by the time you graduate, I'm going to, I'm going to, respond to you. The best way to contact me is through Teams, okay? I'll uh, send me a message on Teams and um, we talk, okay? Another thing that you see that thing up there, that dot thing you, you have over here, and it's green and it's not supposed to be, it's, I'm going to fix all those things that are remote, it's going to get set. If you see that dot is green, it means you can call me. Just literally call me with a microphone and we talk, okay? If this is away like this, you can call me, okay? If I'm at the computer and I hear it, fine. If I'm downstairs and I hear the computer, I run up and pick it up. And if I see if I had a missed call, I, I answer. Um, but if it's busy or it's unavailable, don't call, okay? If it's away or green, if, if it's 3 o'clock in the morning, I don't care. You can call, okay? So no time limit on when it's going to be, as long as it's green or yellow please call, okay? If you need to talk to me, you can send me a, if, uh, the best thing is to send me a private message. When I say private, a one-to-one -one message, just message me, tell me, far that I need to talk to you about such and such. And I see I have, I see now I have six messages over there. It's only from my students. It's not mixed with anything. I just go over there, take a look at the thing. And all our conversation is logged. We know exactly what we talked about. So that's a good thing, okay? So Microsoft Teams is where we talk. All right. Uh, 
You know what the lectures are and stuff. I'm not going to go through that. We know all that. Uh, recordings I just mentioned. Uh, so <clears throat> uh, you are going to live the half of the second half of the semester at this place. OP244, NAA, NBB, and ZAA notes. Every single thing that I do in class is going to go right in here. All the notes, even the recordings. So if you want to know what, uh, if you want to uh, uh, check your recordings, your ZAA, you just click on ZAA, and you will see that the recordings are going to get listed over here, okay? And the in-class notes. So everything's going to be right there, so you can actually see it and go through it and, uh, uh, and see how everything, how everything is done. So, um, and it is on GitHub, therefore it's used, it's, it is using Git. So just to show you how I deal with it, every time that I come, I create an empty project, as you see, and I make that empty project. Uh, this is from last semester. I'm not going to put it over there. So I'm going to go 244 to here and ZAA. I'm going to select the folder. And I'm going to call the project because this is the first one. It's 01 and it's uh, July 5th, right? Make sure when you're creating your directory, you always have this checkbox checked. Okay? Um, and create. We create the uh, project. I usually do that before I come to class, but this is the first time, so I'm just showing it to you how it's going to happen. <clears throat> and uh, then what, I, what I'm, what I'm going to do is uh, let it come up. I just updated this Visual Studio, so hopefully everything is good about it. I don't know all the view. Solution Explorer. Oh, there you go. It was hidden. All right. So in here, I'm going to create a thing, new item. So prg.cpp. And <clears throat> I code when I teach. So as I am teaching, I code right live in front of you. I'm going to make boo-boos. Sorry. This is in front of me. I can't see you. So. So I'm going to make mistakes. You'll see that. I'll try to fix the mistake in front of you like that. You will see how mistakes are made. You will see how they are fixed. And if I can't fix it, I'll go home and try to find out how to fix it. And I'm going to let you know. So um, be like that. Don't be ashamed of making a mistake. As long as you, you work on your mistake and you, and you fix it, you're fine. OK? Nobody knows everything. I've been, I've been doing this for more than close to 30 years, 20-something years, and still I make mistakes, okay? And C++ is my mother tongue, something that I think with, okay? So, uh, <clears throat> so uh, it is extremely important to uh, keep your style the same. Uh, yes? What, font bigger? Better? Okay. Next time, come closer, please. <laughs> okay, because I know I, I'm not going to make it, I, it. There is no problem for me to make it bigger. Please tell me and I'll do it, okay? But the more real estate, the, the, the better I can write. But uh, sure, like those who uh, have problem uh, seeing the screen, please come closer so I can have more real estate over here. Um, is this good now? If, if visible for everyone? I forgot to ask. That's one of the rules of presentation that I uh, forgot to do. So everybody can see it? All right. So int main, return 0. For me, like uh, one of the most important things is not to use tab character in your code. When I say not to use tab character is that go to the options of, uh, of anything that you have, Xcode, Visual Studio, whatever. Go to the text editor settings. And in text editor, I'll go to all languages and uh, go to tabs. And set the tab size to something, say three and three, and insert spaces. Never keep tabs. The reason is that backslash T in your source code, although it's going to get translated to three spaces if you use it, but when you use, move your source code from one, one platform to another, you put it on matrix, suddenly all backslash T's become eight, eight, eight spaces. And you see the beautiful organized code that you have written becomes a mishmash. So, don't use tab in your source code. It keeps your source code clean and easily 
maintainable. Uh, hello, my name is Fardad. And compile and run the code. And it becomes the first program we have written in the second half of the semester. The, uh, we'll, we're gonna, we are starting slow, and uh, there's, there's the execution. And let me make the execution bigger too. It's properties. Uh, let's make it 28. There you go. All right. So that's that. It ran. And now, let's say the lecture is done and finished and we want to go home. So what I do, immediately I'll go to the repository that I have on this computer. Repository is a directory, okay? A directory that are uh, being uh, watched by Git. Git application is like, uh, you know, have you, have you read that thing, the big brother is always watching? It's something like that. So it's like a big brother always watching your code remembering exactly what you do, remembers all the steps that you have done. You can even ask it, okay, I want to go back to last Thursday. All the things that I've done is bad. I want to undo that much, okay? So to do that for every single um, thing that you do, like you're coding and you want to go have lunch, you do this. You commit. So we are ZAA. I'm just going to sit right over here. I'm going to say git commit. And then in here, I'm going to say going to lunch. OK? Of course, it's not going to lunch. It's, I'm going to say first program. OK? And I'm going to click all. And it's going to only put the files you need and nothing else if you follow my workshop zero. It has a file in there. It tells to get what to ignore. So all those gibberish that you have, executables and things and all, they're all ignored, and it only puts the things that you want. And I simply say commit and push at the same time. I can do commit. If you only do commit, it commits it only to this computer. When you say push, it synchronizes it with GitHub. OK? So now when I say commit and push, it commits to this computer and pushes to GitHub at the same time. And now if you actually go to the uh, uh, the ZAA notes, you will see that July 1-5th is over there, first program, and this is the program that I have written, okay? So everything is going to be on the thing. You don't need to, any presentation, any slide that I use, I put it over there. Anything I do in class, it's there, and all the things that I talk about is being recorded, so you have all the tools to review things if you want, and if you miss a session, you can go back and, and continue. Um, and this is how we learn in this semester, in this second half of the semester. Why am I doing this? Um, in this day and age, anybody graduating from computer science who doesn't have a GitHub account is not going to get a job. I'm just being that serious. If you don't know how to work with a code repository, you are going nowhere. It means you cannot collaborate. So if you are the best programmer ever with this genius thing and you can program like crazy, and if you don't know how to work with Git, you're, you're gone. OK? That's why I'm asking you to do the workshop zero. I'm not asking you to, like, I don't think anybody knows Git completely. It's a very complicated system. All you need to do are just five things. One is called clone, which is essentially cloning a repository from Git on your computer or somewhere else. Another one is called pull. Pull is a smart download. It downloads only the changes. So you don't have to keep, like when the new workshop is done, you, you download everything and then you delete the rest. You don't need to do that. You simply pull and only the new workshop comes in. Um, commit uh, creates return points commits this code and says, I can come back to this later. So when I, like, when three days passed and you said, oops, I made a mistake, I wish I could go back to when I was having lunch two days ago, you go to going to lunch commit, and you can simply roll back to that time. As simple as that. Push is the reverse of up, uh, pull, which means it uploads uh, in a smart way uh, only the changes to the 
to what we call upstream. Upstream means um, the, the um, you know, fish goes upstream uh, to, it's the same thing. They call it upstream. It means that's the main repository. Although all repositories are cloned, they are identical. So the repository on your computer is the exact same thing on GitHub servers. No difference. But when you push something to it, it simply uh, uh, updates it with that one. What was the other one? So it's uh, um, clone, push, pull, commit. And there is one more thing called add. What is add? You, did you see that I clicked on all when I committed over there? That was adding automatically because I'm using a graphical user interface. When you're not using a graphical user interface, for those who are using Mac, if you are using, not if, when you use Git, you have to do all these manually on a command line. And it's all in those uh, workshops. You'll see it, how it's done. Uh, you have to first add the files and then commit them because it's a directory, right? And in that directory are several files. You have to tell to Git, I added some new files. Please watch over these ones too. If you don't add them, Git doesn't care about it. So you simply add the, the, the files. And again, it only adds the files that are not supposed to be ignored. It doesn't add garbage ones uh, because uh, it is set up that way. Look at the uh, workshop zero. And you have by the end of this week to finish that thing. So uh, whenever you have trouble with anything, what you do is this. I ask you in workshop zero to create a repository on GitHub. That repository is your home. It, everything you do in OP244 should be done in that one. Again, repository is a directory. It means you have a directory on your computer. That directory becomes a repository now. No difference. It's just the directory. As you see in here, It is only a directory in my file, the only in my computer. But the only difference is that that directory is being watched over using Git. And the identical thing with that repository is now on GitHub. So if I go to the organization, this is the directory that is on my computer, identical to that one. So either this. You see, the two are clones. Exactly this. Oh, not that one. Where did you go? This one. You see? Now, what happens, you're going to create a repository, a private repository of your own. So nobody has access to it. Nobody can see it. This one is public because I'm teaching. Uh, it's a read-only thing. You can, you can clone it. You can uh, uh, look at it. You can change it, but you cannot push your changes back. OK? So what happens is that you're going to create a directory, uh, a, a repository on Git, and you're going to clone it on your computer. Then you're going to move all your work that you have done till now to OP244 into this directory, into this repository, and add all the files to the repository. Then you push. What happens is that all the work you have done throughout the semester will now be on Git, and you keep adding on it. You add me as a collaborator to your own repository, which means now I have read-write access to it. So what happens, you have a problem with your workshop. Right before you call me, you push your code with mistakes and problems and everything that it has. You see me on Microsoft Teams and say, Farda, I have a problem. It doesn't work. I'm going to say, wait a minute. I just pull your changes on my computer, open up your project, share my screen, fix your code, commit and push it back, and say, now pull. You pull everything, you have your problem fixed. And you can actually ask Git to tell you what are the differences. Git gives you two windows. At one left one, it shows what it was. At right one, it shows what it is. So you can actually see exactly what has changed. Your obligation is only tell me in reflect.txt what did I do to fix your code. Got it? And done. OK? But again. When you, so when you contact me, I need two things. Light. Three things. Number one, what's the problem? Number two, your repository with problem in it. Number three, what did you do when it did not fix it? 
I don't want you to, as soon as you hit something, you immediately you call me. I want you to, to think about it, because that's how you learn, right? And that's that. Okay, that's how we do it. I could put an office hour on uh, the, on my schedule. My schedule is in here, so when, uh, when you go to the organization, in, right in here, if you scroll down, you'll see that's my schedule over here. Over here. You see that? So this is my schedule and all the classes and stuff that I have. Why is it like this? Uh, how can I hide this right side thingy? Mm. Let me just make it smaller. Anyways. So yeah, this is my schedule. I could put some office hours somewhere but, and promise that I'll be at my computer at that time if you want to talk to me. So put two hours like that. But I did that every semester. I'm going to do it this semester too, but nobody ever comes. Because I'm available all the time, you know, then office hours doesn't mean anything. Anytime, anytime I'm green up there, I'm, it's office hour. And if you just contact me, and then I'll, I'll, I'll answer. And another thing I'm going to do, then um, if, like, when I'm not available, I say, Farhad, I need to talk to you. Okay? Uh, I immediately say, book an appointment. How do you book an appointment? You go on Microsoft Teams, okay? You go on Calendar, and you click on New Meeting. Then you open Scheduling Assistant, and write over here my name. Then it's going to show you all my available time. You simply click on an available spot, set 30 minutes for a, for a thing, and you set an appointment. It notifies me at the same time we're going to go and open Microsoft Teams and we'll talk. So like that, you can get an appointment at any time that I'm available. I'll, I haven't set it up because I came back to school yesterday. So it's going to take time to, to usually you, we do this before the semester begins, but uh, I just came. So give me to the end of the week. You do your Git repository. I do these. Uh, I'll set up my schedule, uh, and I'm going to set everything, uh, um, um, all my busy time. So I'm going to put like, uh, like from, um, say, 6 o'clock in the afternoon till 8 o'clock in the morning, I'm going to put busy so you don't book an appointment then. But that doesn't mean if I'm available, you can't call me. If it's 3 o'clock in the morning and I'm green or yellow, you can call me, okay? But booking the appointment is only on available spots. We are clear on that? All right. All right. Uh, there goes the cap. Yeah, so you book an appointment and you save and you save. And uh, by the way, although it gives you 30-minute spots, I'm going to ask you for code review to, for example, set a 20-minute spot. Many people do 30 minutes. It doesn't allow me. It does. You have to click on it and edit it. So in here, you, can, you can have to do this and write two. If you do that, it accepts it. Okay? But if you automatically do it, it only gives you half an hour spots. So if I ask you, please book 20 minutes because 50 people are going to, I have 99 students. Okay, if each of them go half an hour, that's a week, right? So, so when I ask you for 20 minute spots, please do 20 minutes for code review. And uh, you, what is code review? Code review is uh, uh, either me, uh, discard, it's either me um, randomly selecting someone to go through your code, okay? Um, so you bring GitHub. And I'll open up GitHub, and I'll go through your code. I'll give you comments. Like, it's better to do this. It's better to do that. Gives you advice. Give you advice. I, writing email is the most inefficient way to give you advice on how to program. Because it takes nine hours to write some text to, to tell you what to do. But when we are both at your code, I can show it to you, comment it, and push it to the repository. So immediately, you're going to get the feedback that you want. Okay, and I'll go through everything and I'll tell you how to make your code better and more efficient. And another thing we, uh, sometimes uh, is you asking me for a code review. You want to know how you're doing, right? You tell me, I want you to go through my code and give me some hints. I'll do that, 
okay? It doesn't matter if it's from first half of the semester, it's from IPC 144, I don't care. Put anything you want in that repository, ask me, I take a look at your code and give you advice and, and try to make your code better. Um, the, the last thing is for me is to see something that doesn't make sense. If I see some code that I don't, it doesn't fit, then I ask for a code review. Say like workshop eight, you have done something over there and I look at something and I'm like, this is not OP244, something's wrong in here. I ask you, you have to explain to me how that piece of code works. If you explain to me, you're good to go. If you don't, the mark for that workshop becomes zero, okay? So cheating is allowed in my class. I don't care if you get the code from somewhere. Two things you need to do. Number one, you have to cite it, which means you have to go at the top of the thing. If you just borrowed the code, you put it over here, you don't know how it works, you cite it. Say, for that, I needed to hand in my assignment. This part of code, I got it from Jack. And this, code, this part of code is not mine. Instead of 100%, you're going to get 95. Lose 5% for that piece, and I'm going to thank you. Thanks, thank Jack for helping you. Okay? And Jack is going to add a comment in his code that I, I don't know, Julian asked for help. I don't know why all my name examples starts with J. But anyway, so, <laughs> but yeah, so Julian asked for help, and I gave him this piece of code. So they are, you are both clear. It makes sure that Jack, because if Jack can't trust you, it just puts it over there, makes sure that if I get it, because if you give the code to someone, you're at fault too. You know that, right? It's cheating, OK? Uh, um, but anyways, you get it from chat GPT. I don't care. You write this part, I got it from ChatGPT, I couldn't do it, I asked it to write it for me, and I don't know how it works. You lose the mark for that, okay? If you get the code from someone, and you know how it works, and you write it over there, and cite it or not cite it, I'll take a look at it. If you can explain it, mission accomplished. Why should I be mad? Your goal is to learn how to code, right? So if you know how the code works, you're good to go. Okay, so my program gets all the workshops and goes through like a DNA search and finds pattern. If the patterns match, it brings up them up. So I can, so the, my program tells me these two look alike. I just bring them up and I see, oh, this function and that function looks the same. If there is a citation, you're fine. If there is no citation, then I'm going to do a code review. Okay? Are we good? All right, so that's, that's how I do it. So please uh, go through it. Uh, let me see uh, what else we need to talk about in here. Yeah, uh, go through workshop zero. And I did the workshop zero for my IPC 144 last semester. And so I actually gave examples of how to create uh, uh, things with Xcode if you want to program with Xcode, because I see you have Mac. You have a Mac too? Yeah. Yeah, so if you want to use Xcode, how to create. So. When you're looking at it, because it's for IPC 144, I'm asking them to use the language as C. The only thing you need to do is to choose language as C++, and you're done, okay? So you can use Xcode, although I don't recommend. I'd rather you uh, uh, either have Cold Fusion or some kind of a, uh, a VMware uh, uh, virtual machine and use Windows, because uh, you're going to have subject uh, courses for Mac, but you need to learn how Visual Studio works for your future. If you just get stuck with your Mac, then you'll be in trouble. Your options for finding a job will be limited. Okay, they're going to ask you, you have to do C Sharp. I don't know because that's done with Visual Studio, right? And when the future semester, now it's easy. When it comes to semester six and you are doing game programming and you're using Visual Studio, that's not a time that you want to learn how Visual Studio works because you need to learn how parallel processing works, how multi-threading works, right? That's a difficult part. You, do, you want at that time to be working with an IDE, an integrated development environment that you're familiar with. So all those people who have Mac, I suggest it, VMware is free. Uh, the links are over there. You can download it, um, put it on your computer, and you have a Windows computer right on your computer. You just bring it up. The good thing is that, like Boot Camp, it doesn't use half of your hard drive. So it just uses a tiny bit of your hard drive, and when you shut it down, your Mac is powerful like before. Okay? 
So all you need to do is to bring the uh, VMware on, and the, uh, it's as if you have a new computer. It's very simple and straightforward. I think I have actually uh, something in here. So there you go. So I, like this is VMware. I open VMware now. And there you go. That's a demo. So if I just start this machine now, uh, if I just start this machine, a, a Windows operating system is going to start. As if I, I see, it's, it's restoring the virtual machine from last state, but it's as if I'm booting the computer. So this window is a completely separate computer. If you have a Windows computer, do that. It's good for messy stuff. If there is something you are not sure it has virus, you do it on that. So it doesn't hurt your computer. If something goes wrong, you just wipe it out and create another one, right? It's just the software. Anyways, so I don't want to download and install anything, so I'm going to say remind me later. And um, um, OK, I let it do its thing, and I'm going to uh, stop it afterwards. So it's very, very, very helpful and very handy, OK? And if you have two computers, you want to do networking and see how the networking between two computers when I experiment those things. You just create a VMware, you have an extra, co extra computer at no expense. For, for students, they're all free, OK? Just use your uh, Seneca email, and, uh, and you're done. So I'm just going to shut this down, because it's not going to start to update. So what I can do over here is just suspend guest. The good thing is that suspend guest uh, Saves it exactly as this state. Saves it exactly as this state, and uh, it kind of puts the computer in sleep. So when you start it later, it, it, it is exactly where it's where you left it. Yes, there we go. So that's that. What else do we need to talk? Don't worry for, from, for, for falling behind. You're not going to fall behind. All those people who didn't come over here, that's sad because uh, um, with Workshop Zero, we're going to be in trouble when they, when they contact me for help. I cannot help you if you don't have that one. It takes too much time, okay? And all my helping hours and everything like that, they're all online. Face-to-face uh, -face is very time-consuming. Put a computer, turn on the computer, sit beside each other, get the person's computer. But that takes time. Like this, it's efficient, quick, and uh, um, it easily... Uh, uh, reviewable let's put it that way i'm going to put this one too busy so they don't call me by mistake now okay so that's that one um, i strongly suggest in the calendar of uh, microsoft teams put your real life schedule your classes uh, taking your daughter to recital, I don't know, whatever, they want, whatever thing you know, uh, well, I don't know, the, having a birthday, but put all those things over there so, so when you tell me, Farhad, can you call me, I can actually look at your time, see if you are free, and I'll book an appointment with you, okay? So, and it's, it's being organized. Uh, you are learning to be a professional, okay? Start it from now. It's good for your health. All right, uh, what else? Oh, somebody actually, see, somebody booked a meeting with me and then uh, canceled. Anyways. <laughs> was it you? Who did somebody did it now? <laughs> it was you? <laughs> there we go. <laughs> Thank you. There we go. So, uh, you see, it's nice. I, like, I can actually see if somebody booked a meeting, and, uh, and these are all nice stuff. So he's actually trying it right now, and I'm happy. All right. Next thing, uh, let's go back to here. Uh, My party gen is version, yada, 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 okay, no, 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 I don't know, try it. I will, I'll have to answer that later. Anyway, so, uh, uh, ta -da, ta -da, ta -da, workshop zero, cold radio we talked. Final project. Final project is already up um, since, uh, like, uh, I, I put it at the beginning of the study break. So it's been up for, like, 10 days now. Um, uh, that's pretty straightforward. Uh, we'll go through the um, the um, go through the uh, description of what needs to be done and uh, try to do it as soon as possible. Uh, I will set the uh, the submission scripts um, and send it to all the faculty so 
you can actually check and see if you have done it properly. The, the submission scripts are not set yet for the, for the project, but I will do it and I'll send it. Oh, maybe I did it already, did I? Oh, so it is set? I don't know. Saturday? It's, it's, I think it's, if it's on, which Saturday? This Saturday? So I think it's correct then. July 8th, yeah, that's correct. Okay, so that's milestone one, okay? And uh, um, the fir the, as you see, there are five milestones for the project, okay? The first four milestones, they have uh, a loose type of a due, due date, which means if you're even one week late, you get full mark, no problem, okay? Uh, but try to be on time, and they're very easy. Like if you start right now, you're done with milestone one the day after tomorrow. Two hours a day, four hours, it's done. Like, seriously, I, I did half of it myself. You're just supposed to do some operator over the very simple stuff, okay? Um, uh, do it. Uh, they, we, we, there is this thing, they say release often and release early. Do that, okay? And um, keep committing your work to your Git repository and push it. Why? Because if at the end of the semester some, you need help, I see that uh, you, you need 1%, 2% to pass the thing or something like that, that's when I go check your repository to see how active you were. If I see you're actively working on everything till the end of the semester, it means you're trying to learn. You need help. But if I see you submitted everything three days before the thing, like suddenly you submitted everything at the two hours before the due date, I know you got it from your friend. Okay? So actively commit so I can see the history of your work, that you're steady. Every, and believe me, every single code that you write and test, commit it and push it. Have in your repository a place, like, I don't know, call it sandbox, okay, that you play with code in there. In, and keep pushing it. It's a beautiful thing to do. You get used to Git, and I know that you're working. All right? Uh, the last one, so each one of these things have 10%. And their submission is mandatory. It means if you do not submit milestone one at all, your project is incomplete. Therefore, your mark for the subject is incomplete. So milestone one, two, three, and four must be submitted. Why? Because it's a complicated project. If I wanted to test everything on a last milestone, you had to sit at your computer for three hours, do data entry. I didn't want that. So I tested stuff that are supposed to be tested for date, for example, in the first one. So I don't have to check it in the last one. Okay? That's why we have milestones. So do first one, second one, third one, fourth one, and be done with it. And then for, for milestone five, you have six submissions. Each submission is worth 10%. For your project to be considered successfully submitted, you need those five milestones and at least one of the submissions of milestone five, which is 50% of the mark. Okay? If you have two submissions of milestone five, you get 60%. Three, and it keeps like that. If you have all six, you get 100%. And do it, and if you do nice and cool stuff, not extra stuff, cool stuff, if you have developed an algorithm that does something, if you uh, created a few things yourself, did, have a library that did stuff manually by yourself, add those things in the reflection at the top of the thing, you get bonus marks. Many students of mine got 115% in their, in their uh, project because they did extra work. Okay? And I ask questions in class, today you're going to see it. Um, I give bonus marks at class. I'm going to say 4% for midterm, or midterm is gone. <laughs> I'm going to say like, I don't know, 3% 3, 3 for final. So I add 3% to your mark to, to your final mark because of the proper and good answer that you gave in class, okay? Uh, I do stuff like that, so be aware of it. Those bonus marks really come handy. And I sometimes ask you to write an algorithm to do something. I like when something is challenging, I say, if you can do that, then fine, but those you have to defend. Because last semester I did that, somebody gave it to Jack JPD and it wrote it perfectly and, and then they gave it to me and I looked at the thing and it was using some stuff that somebody with PhD in computer science needed to 
you know, and, and, I, and the guy did a code review. And it was uh, very shameful. So, so don't do that, OK? Understand what's going on in there. All those, yeah. When you are studying, cheating is sh shooting yourself in the foot. You don't believe it, you're going to find out when you actually get a job. OK? Careful. So that's the project. Um, we'll go through it soon. Any questions before we start? Yes. There is no school domain GitHub. GitHub does not belong to Seneca. I know, I know, but like uh, it's associated with basically I can only use it there. Like Twitter. No, GitHub is completely separate thing. You don't need any VPN of any kind. You create a private repository of your own that has nothing to do with school. Okay, but like uh that uh exercises of it require us to use uh Seneca dot college and then GitHub. Uh, I know. No, no, no. GitHub gives you accounts for free. When you go through Workshop Zero, it's your own private thing. It has nothing to do with Seneca. It's going to okay. stay with you forever, which brings me to this. When I'm asking you to create a user ID and password, okay, angry boy is not a good name. <laughs> okay, don't, don't use IDs like that. Imagine yourself that you're 50 years old, CEO of a company, and that's what you're going to be recognized with. Or, I don't know, cat killer. Don't do that, OK? Or I hate dogs. Don't do that, OK? I don't know, cool dude, uh, beauty queen, these are nice. Why not? Cool dude. I'm a cool dude and I'm a CEO of a place. There's no problem. But cat killer? No, you don't do that, OK? So th think, be cool, uh, but be a little mature too at the same time, OK? The internet never forgets, ever, ever. OK? Never forgets. And there comes, there comes a time that you'll be ashamed by the choices you made when you were 20 years old. <laughs> OK? So don't do that. Yes. In GitHub, you can put several different emails. OK? But I strongly suggest you put your own email, put Seneca email too, and for now, make it primary. When it's done, remove it and make your own primary. The reason is that when you do something like that, when you put your own email over there, when I change something, you get an email from GitHub. GitHub sends a notification to your email. You can ha if you're happy with your Gmail, sure, you can use that one. But having your own school ID over there for now, it's good because you see emails in your school account and you see it and so on and so forth. But nothing is permanent in Git. If you do workshop zero, it's only Belong, it only belongs to you. That's it. OK. And have your avatar set properly. Put your picture over there. Put your name correctly. In GitHub, you can have, just have an ID. Don't do that. Put your complete name when you do that. Because people Google your complete name. And when GitHub account comes up, that's the person who gets hired. OK? Make sure you put your full name, all your information properly in GitHub. Uh, so you are visible. It adds to your visibility for future. It's extremely important. What else? All right. Any question? Any other question? What was that assignment thingy? Which subject was that? Oh, software test. Oh, okay. Sure, sure, sure. That's fine. Okay. That's probably GitHub Education. Yeah, that's called GitHub Education. Yeah, that's, that's a different story. Well, with with uh, GitHub Education, GitHub creates a, uh, um, a system in which automatically it creates repositories for the students. Yes, and then you do your work over there, and the professor goes, checks over there. I don't do that. I wrote the submitter not to do that. So it is your own. What you are doing in Workshop Zero is for you and all remains for you forever. OK? I'm asking you to create an individual account for yourself. All right? 
All right. Uh, anything else? Uh, do dash two. I, I haven't set it up yet. Yeah, yeah, because it's I didn't set it up yet. Okay, I, I told you I came here yesterday. <laughs> okay, give me a second. I'll set the due dates for it, and uh, I think by tomorrow night you can do a dash two and see when is the due date. And it's gonna be I'm gonna set the due date on a Saturday or something for this the, for workshop six. Okay, I'll do something like that to, 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 to make sure everybody has have enough time, and then we go back to our normal thing the next time. Okay, so depending on uh, uh, your lab is when. So it's, it's tomorrow, right? Yeah. So I'll put it, I think I'll put it like three, four days after that. So if it's Friday, it's, it was Friday? Your lab is Friday, you said? Thursday, Thursday. Thursday. Oh, yeah. Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Probably I'll put the due date for Monday then. Something like that. Yeah. Because you only have one, right? There are not two of them. Okay. Um, yeah, anything else? Questions? Suggestions? Objections? All right. So now what I'm going to do, I am going to see how much you know. I'm going to see how much you know. And you'll see how I teach. Okay? So rules of the game, I ask questions, you answer. I use your answer to form the next question from the next student, and I keep going like that. If you are not in a mood, you cannot answer, you don't want to answer, for any reason you simply say pass. It means I don't want to answer, I'm not in a mood, I'll go to the next person. If you are at the end of the class and you see at the front I ask the question and you hear three passes, you can come to rescue, which means then you can say, can I answer? I know the answer. Then you answer, and it continues from there. OK? That's how I do it. And everybody talks. I do not like a uh, one-way uh, one communication, like two-way communication. OK? You'll find out in, in uh, it's called um, full duplex communication. You're going to learn it in networking later on. Anyways, not half duplex, full duplex. All right, so uh, what is it? The class ends at 3.15, right? You want to take a five minutes break before, before I uh, poke your brains? All right, all right. So, <laughs> okay, so, so pause, it is. What is object oriented? Why object oriented programming and not C? Classified. What does it mean to classify? Yeah. Encapsulate. What is encapsulation? What is encapsulation? Would you like like hide and seek? Like you no. can. Okay. <laughs> Encapsulation. Do you agree? Or is, can you complete what he said? It is essentially encapsulation is called information hiding. Okay? So what you're saying, it means you read it somewhere. Good. But what does it mean? What does encapsulation mean? And by the way, why not C? Why C not C? Because in C you can't do encapsulation. For now, we don't know what encapsulation is. We did that in C. We had all the data in a structure, didn't we? Then how you access it when it's private? Uh, access it 
uh, where? Functions. Where? Implementation of what? So you, you are saying it, but again, this is, you need to learn to talk. And first of all, we are friends, okay? Don't think that your three teachers trying to like, torture you with this, okay? Just ask the question as if you were talking to your friend, okay? It's this, this, I just want us to think and I want us to uh, understand why we are in this semester. This is very important. I usually do this at the beginning of the semester, but I don't have it now. I'm doing it now. Okay? So what is encapsulation, my friend? Same thing. No. Yeah, information. Hide, hide the code, you said. So what is the difference between hiding the code and hiding the information? See, you all know, but you cannot say it. What is encapsulation? Oh, you said pass. Uh, is it still pass? I can say it. Oh, sure, sure. So, uh, don't want other, other to change, uh, yes, but stuff. that's not encapsulation. You're in, a, in an interview, and they want to get hired because you know C++. They tell you, what is object orientation? You say object orientation has encapsulation, and they say, okay, what is encapsulation? First of all, what, is, what does it mean? English. What does it mean to encapsulate? To put things together, right? Put things together. What are the things that we are putting together in C++? Information is variable. So they are the same. Say it. Data and the function. Data and the function, that's the big hoopla about C++. C couldn't do that. I couldn't have a function inside the structure. Now I'm putting a function inside the structure. So that structure now we call it a class because it has encapsulation, which is putting the data and behavior together and adds information hiding, which means people cannot Access, when I say people, other classes cannot access the information of the class unless the class is willing to give that information out using the functions. You know what does it look like? It's like, you I'll ask your father that we want to go eat. Do you have money? And I say, yes, I go. Do, let's go. That's fine, right? But you can't say, let's go for lunch and put your hand in my pocket and try to see if I have money or not. You can't do that. That's encapsulation. You can ask me, I will tell you. And maybe I have money and I don't want you to know. So I can tell you I don't have money, but I have it. That's what a class does. And that's what C cannot do. In C, you cannot put a function. A function is not related to its data. Okay? That's encapsulation, putting the data and behavior together putting the methods and attributes together. Method is the behavior, and attributes are the data. OK? Are we OK with this? What is the second hoopla about object orientation? Second hoopla. See, we have three hooplas. Three things that object orientation does that C cannot do. Non-object oriented programming can't, can't do. The first one is encapsulation. Second one, what is inheritance? Of course, because we did that in C. In C, I had a function, I called another function. Again, you know it, but don't know how to say it. Fix it. <laughs> Inherit from another class. What does that mean? I think that all of the uh, data and uh, functions. Bravo, which means what does it do? We, he's, we said that the inheritance means we have one class and we make another class out of that class and it has all the functions and data of that class now. 
What does that mean? Yes and no. So let me clear this thing up because it's going nowhere. Inheritance is reusing design. Inheritance is to reuse design. When you design something and you're done with it and that design doesn't work for you anymore, you don't throw it away. If I have a bicycle and, I want, and I'm tired of pedaling and I want to go comfortably, I put an engine on a bicycle and I call it a motorcycle. A motorcycle has everything that a bicycle has. It modifies some things of a, motor, of a bicycle, but it's a motorcycle. Therefore, motorcycle inherits something from a bicycle. So, so we say motorcycle is a bicycle. Whenever you have is a relationship, you have inheritance. Okay? Okay? I am a human being. I am a male human being. Right? Human being is a mammal. Correct? That's inheritance. Okay? Mistakenly, they say, I inherited from my father. No, you don't do that. My father and I are instances of the same object, of the same class. We are both human being, male, male human beings. We are just two objects of the same class. It has nothing. It's like, for example, in here. Now, <clears throat> so we learned that, so when we create a class, we can create a, you don't know how yet, we're going to learn it. Okay, but when we create a class, we can use that class and reuse that class to build a new class so we don't have to implement all the good things that we had before. Okay? <clears throat> yeah, so anything that a master class, a, a, a parent class can do, the child class can do it too. That's what's inheritance. And what is the third thing? in object orientation. We have encapsulation, we have inheritance, and we have, look. <laughs> polymorphism. What is polymorphism without looking at your computer? What is polymorphism? What is polymorphism? Having many forms, what does that mean? Oh, yo, 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 you guys are in trouble. Uh, my lady, can you give me an example of polymorphism in real life? Can anybody? Airplane and? What is polymorphic about it? What is the same function? Flying. An airplane can fly and a bird can fly. They are both of type flying object. Okay, so a flying object can fly. An airplane can fly, a pigeon can fly, uh, uh, a rocket can fly, uh, a mosquito can fly. They are all flying objects. So you can tell to that flying object, fly depending on what type of flying object is, the flying will happen that way. So polymorphism means doing the same thing in different ways. Hence, many, many forms, many shapes. Okay? For example, a human being talks. Right? But then when it comes to type of the human being, the, the version of talking is different. If I have a Persian human being, it speaks Farsi. If I have uh, uh, a Chinese human being, Mandarin, Cantonese, and other 5,000 languages, that is, that is there, right? If I have an Indian, there are so many languages over there, I'm not going to even try. But, but, but again, depending on what type of human being I have, the action of talking is different. They are all talking, they are all communicating, but in a different way. Do we understand this? That's polymorphism. All right? Why object-oriented programming? 
I always give this example in my classes. And um, 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 I mentioned that every single class I do it at the beginning of the semester, and I'm going to do it now. So I want you to really, I'm, I'm going to give you uh, a scenario. And I want you to really close your eyes and think about it, OK? Imagine it is 2 o'clock in the morning, and you're sound asleep. Are you there? Great, two o'clock in the morning. It was a tired thing. You're asleep, deep sleep. You hear somebody saying, hello. You wake up. I want you to picture it. You wake up. You look around. No one's there. You hear hello again. You turn on the light, nobody's there. What do you do? Probably pee in your pants. Why? What feature of object orientation is missing in here that gives you the creeps? What we don't care about in the C. You had a function without an owner. All the functions in C were like that. You print. Does that print belong to anyone? No. It just, out of nowhere, printing comes out. It's exactly 2 o'clock in the morning, and you, you hear a hello with nothing. Now picture again, it's 2 o'clock in the morning. Your six-year-old daughter or sister comes beside your bed and says hello. And you wake up, he says, what? He says, I had a nightmare. Can I sleep with you? Life is beautiful. Nothing went wrong. Because the action of hello now has an owner. Right? Are we good with that? All right? All right? Now, encapsulation. Again, picture yourself sleep. I want to violate the encapsulation. OK? So you're sound sleep. You feel a movement. You wake up. You see your six-year-old daughter or sister comes to your beside the bed and says, hello. What would you do? Like Arnold Schweitzer, hello. What would you do? Again, you pee in your pants. Why? Because the function, greeting function of your sister did not use the attribute of your sister's voice. It used someone else's. Every action in a class picks up the data of that class. Therefore, everything makes sense. That's why they call it object-oriented. Because that happens in real life. They make it like that so your brain can work. Your brain cannot work in a structured programming sense. You can just go up to a certain level. After that, it becomes too complicated. But in an object-oriented world, in an object-oriented program, you design the class, and you forget it. Because everything happens the way it's supposed to. Because you are simulating the real world's design in your program. Do we understand this? Do you understand the importance of it now? Just imagine if you are sitting in a car, you press the gas pedal, and instead of your car, this car beside you goes faster. Isn't that stupid? Or you push the brake, the other car stops, and you go. That's C. But in a car, you have an action of brake. When you brake, this car stops. The speed attribute of this car becomes zero. You follow? OK. So now we know what object orientation is and why do we need it. What is the very first thing that you learn, polymorphic thing that you learn in, in, uh, in uh, what do we have here to go through? Programming, spiegelding, uh, names, namespaces, really. We'll talk about namespaces later on. It's, it's an extremely object-oriented matter, and uh, talking about it here does not make sense. So object terminology, we went through it. Modular programming. How do we modularize our, uh, our uh, how is it different, uh, a module in C and a module in C++? Uh, how do I ask? Any, anybody volunteering for this? Harassment? 
No? You look happy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what's the, uh, how do you modularize something in C language? Do you remember that? What was a module? What is a module? Do you remember what a module is? Dividing. What? Dividing what in parts? Like meat? Or what do you divide? <laughs> So you put header files. What do we put in a header file? Header file. Prototype. Yeah, anything that everybody wants to access. Yeah. So essentially, header files are for introduction. Okay, in a header file, you introduce to your files what is available, so they can use. You want to. Do input output, you add, include standard input output. You want to do input output in C, C, you include IO stream. Right? Okay? So, how is it different in C and C? In C, we try to, to the best of our ability, organize the functions that are related with each other and put them in one module. A module is one programming file and one header file. That's one module, okay? So we try our best to put everything that are related to, to, together into one thing, and we are not really good judge of that. We keep messing things up, and uh, because of that, C language becomes pretty uh, uh, unorganized. In C++, they made it easy. They said, you create a class. The class definition goes to a header file. The class methods. <laughs> Go to the C++ file. Done. And because classes are designed in a perfect object-oriented way, your module will always sum. And anybody who wants to use that class includes the header file of the class, and the class becomes available. OK? Usually, I go through how the compiler works at the beginning of the semester, but we can't do it now because we don't have enough time. Um, maybe later on you ask me, and I'll let you know. What is a type? A fundamental type, all, all the types that are in the syntax of the language. Those are all fundamental types. Fundamental types are, I call it dumb types. They are pretending to be classes, but they are not. Okay? That's one of the things about C++. C++ is not an object-oriented language. Let me correct that. C++ is not a fully object-oriented language. The fact that you have a function called main that doesn't have an owner is not object-oriented, correct? Why they call it plus plus? Do you know? What is plus plus in, in C? Add one. Pardon? Yes, it's exactly, thank you. It's C language with one additional feature, which is object orientation. That's why they call it C++. So C++ is C with object-oriented cap capability. That's why they call it. And uh, those people who don't like C++, they make fun of it. They say C++ even has a bug in its name because it, it will not have the feature until the, 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 the language is over. <laughs> because plus plus is coming after. They should have called it plus plus C. <laughs> but anyway, so yeah. So, so, so that's what it is. That's, uh, that's what, what, what we deal with. And the types in C++, anything uh, that comes with the language, like bool, char, short, long, float, double, long, double, and all those things, they are primitive types. They are types that they, uh, we pretend they are classes, but they are not. Okay? Any other class that you create, it's a type two. Those types are called compound types. Good. Compound type. So compound type is essentially a type that the compound type is a type that is is a type that at least say pass if you don't <laughs> let me see. <laughs> How about you? Anyone? Yes, but in other words, is a type that is made up of other types. 
That's a compound type. Okay, a class you create in a class, you have a Boolean and an integer and a string and things, right? Okay. All right, so compound types. So anything that you have, that's another difference between C and C++. In C language, you create a structure, it's not a type. You have to, to recreate it, you have to say struct something, something to create something out of it, right? In C++, you say class student, and to create a student, you simply say student A, and you create something out of it. So, what is the difference between an object and a class? Or what is the relationship between them? Object. No. I know what you want to say, but no. That way that you said it is not right. What is the difference between an object and a class? Not difference. Explain what is object is what class is. Thank you. Okay? Class is the design. Object is what we make out of that design. We have one class called student. How many students do we have in class, in this class? So you are objects of type student. Got it? All right? So you can have many objects of the same type, but you cannot have many classes of the same. It doesn't even make sense <laughs> saying something like that. Class is the design. Object is the instance of that design. What else? And overloading, what does it mean to overload? Oh, auto keyword. Forget about it until OP345. Okay? Don't use it. Don't use auto. It's against my religion. Don't do that. Okay? <laughs> don't use auto because we don't know what it does. It's not really necessary. You need it in 345. You don't need it now. Okay? Don't use it. Okay, so. Uh, um, ba -ba 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 -ba. We talked about those things. Yeah, so overloading, what is overloading? What is overloading? Yeah, to overload, what does it mean? Overloading. Different parameters, actually. Yeah, different okay. Parameters. So function with the same name and different parameters. That's the first polymorphic thing that you learn in C++. You can create functions that they have same name, but they have different parameters. And C++ can recognize it. You can have an add function with two integers and an add function with two doubles. The name can be add. You can't do that in C. That's one of the polymorphic things from C++. Are we OK with this? Are we okay? So, in other words, signature of a function in C language is only its name. Signature of a function in C++ is its name and the argument types. So, when you're saying in add in C++, in C, C only sees add. But when you, when you write the function add in C++, C++ sees add int int, add double double. Because of that, the two are different. Because the types of a function are part of the signature of the function. And that's how the polymorphic thing, is, that's how the polymorphic thing um, is implemented. Holy schmoly dynamic memory allocation. Dynamic memory allocation. Dynamic memory allocation is, I'll, I'll show you what it is. <laughs> Un momento, por favor. Okay, let me see if I go to presentation, what is it going to do? Okay, it's showing it wrong. Let me fix it. Display settings. What is it? Swap prison. There you go. That's much better. OK. <clears throat> this is statically allocated memory. 
Remember, that L-Y is an extremely important thing. Statically, Lee. If you say static, that's a completely different ballgame in C++. So not static, statically allocated memory. Statically allocated memory essentially means the good old things that you've always used in C and C++. Anything that you created, OK? How do they work? I say integer A5, I'm going to have five integers. So essentially, we know from how arrays are created, when I say integer A5, A is a pointer pointing to the beginning of series of integers that are in memory. We know that, right? And that's how it happens. So when you say integer A5, inside the executable program, compiler puts five integers. Therefore, when your program runs, that executable goes into memory, you use that five integers, and when the program is finished, the executable goes out of the memory by operating system, and your integers go with it, because it was inside the executable. Are we OK with this? This is a statically allocated memory. What is dynamic memory allocated memory? It is when you only have the pointer inside the executable. And while the program is running, so this one is happening when you are coding and compiling. It has nothing to do with running your program. When you compile the top program, everything, the array and everything, will be in the executable on your hard drive. And when it runs, it comes up with it. When you say integer pointer A is set to new int 5, you're actually telling the compiler, telling your program to run this command while the program is running. Your executable does not have the integer, the five integers in it. It only has the pointer. That's why your executable, when you do dynamic memory allocation, your executables are very small because they don't have the data in them, OK? So when your program runs, the executable comes in the memory. And then programs run, program runs. When it reaches to this, it asks the operating system, operating system, please give me five integers from the free memory, shared memory between all. That is called heap. Heap is the memory that all programs share. The operating system looks that you want five integers. It says, OK, five integers. That's 20 bytes. I'm going to go find 20 contiguous uh, uh, bytes in memory and grab it, tag it for your program, and send the address to you. And you put the address in A. And f as of that moment, A becomes an array exactly like a regular statically allocated memory. Doesn't make any difference. You go through it, you do all your stuff, and you're done. But the catch is that when you do that, because you allocated memory, you are responsible to delete it. In the first one, when the executable goes out of the, out of the memory, your array goes with it. In the second one, only your pointer goes with it. So whatever that is left over there, will be memory leak. And if you keep running this program, and that memory is never going away. It's permanent. It stays in your RAM forever. What is forever in computers? Until you reboot. So it's going to stay in there until, and have you ever had this? Uh, Wi-Fi thingy at home and it doesn't work and you call Roger and says, unplug it, wait for 15 minutes and plug it back in? That's the reason. That's the reason. Because the code, the firmware in it, leaks memory. As the connections are created over and over and over, the memory of your router gets full with garbage because they are not deallocated. And because there is no memory, the, the program doesn't work anymore. And that's when it crashes. And that's when you take it out, put it back in, and it works for another three weeks until it dies again. OK? So that's dynamic memory allocation. Are we OK with this? Why dynamic memory allocation? And what advantages that gives us? Huh? 
<clears throat> oh, one thing I have to tell you. <clears throat> when we are in class, please use your opera voice. You have to talk like that. I cannot hear you. Yeah, use your opera voice, okay? <laughs> so I can hear you. So you were saying, what are the advantages? No, you can allocate more space with the other one too. During runtime. Ah, so you can change the size of your memory as, thank you. So that's one thing. You can change the size of five is not enough. You can add more to it. It's a little tricky, but you can, right? What is the other advantage of it? Yeah, your program doesn't use as much memory. You use it only when you need it. And then you are, if you're a good programmer, of course. If you're not a good programmer, you just have a bunch of memory allocated, you screw up the computer and nobody, you know, yeah, anyways, but, if, but you have the capability. That's one of the things about C++. You can shoot yourself in the foot, or you can actually write proper programs, okay? So that's, the, that's one of the advantages of uh, dynamic memory allocation that we need to, uh, to understand. Another thing is that you can decide how much memory you need after you run. Like, it's, it's a very simple thing. If I told you, uh, write a program, that receives series of integers and prints them in reverse order. It's impossible to write in C without dynamic memory allocation. Because I didn't mention you how many. I said, get a bunch of integers, and you say, OK, how many? I say, I don't know. So I'm going to put 1,000. What if it's 1,001? Right? But when you are actually doing dynamic, you can ask the user, OK, how many integers do you have? User looks at it and says 592. And you say, okay, I'm going to create 592, and then you do it. And even if it's not enough, you can resize it, right? That's a beautiful thing about it, yes. Of course you can. You can do it in C, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's malloc, alloc, and all those things. Don't forget, C++ is written in C. <laughs> Anything you do, well, people think that when it's object-oriented, some magical thing is happening in CPU. No. The object orientation is only for our brain. It's the compiler. It has nothing to do. When you go down to CPU level, it's all the good old loop stuff and everything. There is no classes when the assembly is running. Okay? It still gets translated to that gibberish that it was before. The only difference is that we can organize our thoughts. That's the only difference. Okay? And that's why C++ is so efficient, because you can choose when to do what. If you are using Java, you can't do that. You cannot delete when you want. In Java, you allocate. Java says, I'm going to delete it when I'm good and ready. So what happens is that you write a game with it, and your character is running. And suddenly, Java decides to deallocate the memory. And the character suddenly pauses, and then goes again. <laughs> OK? In C++, it's not like that. You delete when you need to delete, when you want to delete. It's your choice when to do it. Again, with power comes responsibility. Because of that, 90% of the time, you forget a byte here, here or there, and then you have to keep rebooting your computer. Hello. Is it there? Math? No. No problem. Come here when you want C++. All right. <laughs> kind of math, right? We added one to C. It's math. Anyways. <laughs> All right. So that's that. So we, we went down to here, actually, like in the other class, OK? And I wanted to continue with the rest of dynamic memory allocation stuff and go through detail and tell you what is good and what is bad and you know, all the good stuff, but we didn't go through it. So I'm going to stop it over here to keep the classes in sync. Uh, you guys, oh, let me just uh, pause it, uh, pause the recording. <clears throat>